trust. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, as Jennifer said, <clears throat> my name is Joellen Wilson. I'm the Juvenile Tarpon Habitat Program Manager for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. And today I'll be talking about habitat restoration with a purpose. And although we're looking at fisheries, as you'll see, it's mostly about the restoration aspect. Next slide. So habitat restoration is quickly becoming an accepted means of combating this global habitat loss and degradation that we're all experiencing. However, many restoration projects are lacking a clear purpose. So in order to have an informative project, you must one, be able to gauge success. Um, how do you know that the, the property or the place that you've restored was better off after you restored it? Um, two, you need to design for a specific habitat type or a species with the goal to increase the productivity. Um, which could mean different things for different habitat and different species. And also three, um, to either inform resource management or inform your future projects, your future restoration projects. So think about each project serving as a building block or a learning experience for the next project. Next slide. So far, our fisheries restoration projects have focused on coastal habitats since they seem to be the most at risk from human development. Um, and they also serve as critical refuge for juvenile life stages and also prey sources for all life stages. So juveniles typically don't have the mobility that adults do, which deters them from moving out of these degraded habitats. And instead, they're remaining in these habitats at the cost of productivity in the form of potentially growth or survival. Next slide. Two species in particular that are reliant on these backwater habitats as juveniles um, and these habitats that have sustained heavy impacts are common snook and Atlantic tarpon. And we can use them to determine how well the habitat is functioning or how productive it is for juveniles. However, they're also acting as an umbrella species for the other organisms that rely on these habitats. So although we focus on, on these two fish, we're really looking at all the organisms organisms that can benefit from specific habitat restoration. So ultimately we're using the fish to quantify how well the habitat is functioning. Next slide. One of our current study sites is located off the west branch of Coral Creek. So this is near Charlotte Harbor, Boca Grande area, just south of Rotunda, if you're familiar with that. Um, it was developed in the 1960s as residential property. Um, and advertised as having saltwater access. Next slide. Now this land is now owned by the state of Florida and managed by DEP as part of Charlotte Harbor Preserve State Park. Um, it was already selected as a restoration site by the Southwest Florida Water Management District when members of Charlotte Harbor FWC Lab and also DEP found juvenile tarpon rolling in the northernmost saltwater canal. Next slide. So this presented a great opportunity, which was also kind of unprecedented to change designs. So kudos to Swift Mud for being flexible. We caught them um, at the early stages. Um, and this allowed BTT scientists, FWC, and members of CHNEP to alter the restoration design because the original plan was to fill the canals back in since that's what was natural um, to that specific site. But instead, we were able to create three different nursery habitat designs that would each be duplicated in the six canals. Now, this way we can test and quantify specific design elements. Um, so instead of just a before and after restoration, we can see which specific elements were the most successful, were the most productive, and then we can replicate those in our future habitat restoration projects. Next slide. Really a vital component of habitat restoration should be including pre-restoration monitoring. Um, this is so critical that you have a baseline for comparison. So that way, once the project's finished, that's really the only way to gauge success. So you can't restore a site 
look at it afterwards and deem if it was successful if you don't know how the habitat was functioning prior to the habitat restoration. So although we want to know how the habitat is functioning, that is very difficult to measure. So instead we use the fish. Um, at this specific site, Coral Creek, for 16 months prior to restoration, we sampled monthly and we determined uh, abundance, so how many fish were in there, survival, how the fish were uh, surviving from year to year, also growth rates, how fast were the fish growing. That's one of the main measures of productivity, um, especially as juveniles, um, since it's a really good strategy is to grow pretty quickly. So we wanted to see it, were there growth issues uh, before and after the restoration and how did they compare. Also movement within the system. So did they use the different treatments that we designed or did they come in and, and stick to a certain one for a year or a couple of years while they were in the nursery habitat? And then finally movement out of the system, which arguably is the most important, which we term immigration. Um, all too often, especially with juvenile tarpon, we hear about them getting into places as larvae, um, golf course ponds, ditches, um, community retention ponds, things like that. But if they never get out and never leave the system or never contribute to the adult population, um, then they're basically not contributing and not productive. So we need to see that they're moving back out of the system and also what size and at what rates they're able to immigrate from these nursery habitats. So at Coral Creek, the habitat restoration has been completed by Swift Mud, and we're in the process of completing the post-restoration sampling now. I didn't get too much into the method details, but we use RFID tags. These don't have a battery, so they'll last the life of the fish. Think of them as like a microchip for your, your pet implanted. Every snook and tarpon was implanted with a tag, and they each have a unique ID number, and that's really how we're able to Oops, sorry, next slide. That's really how we're able to um, get those quantifiable measurements is by using these RFID tags. Next slide. So again, I want to reiterate and implore you to think about these when you're planning your next restoration project. So like I said, each project should be a building block to inform the next one. And although I'm using fish, um, and juvenile habitats, think about it in terms of the species or habitat that you're working on. So for example, oysters or seagrass or bird rookeries. When you're planning your projects, do you have a baseline um, of pre-restoration monitoring to know if your project was successful? And are you applying these successful design principles to your future projects? Next slide. So finding sites to restore can also be a challenge. And we've compiled a prioritized habitat restoration list of sites that already have juvenile snook and tarpon in it. Um, our plan of action was to say, okay, let's see where they are right now um, and focus on restoring those sites versus restoring sites and seeing if uh, the larvae will come into the site. So in 2016, we started our juvenile tarpon habitat mapping project, and we asked anglers for their input of where they were finding tarpon that were 12 inches and under. Um, you can see these are the questions that we asked them specifically. And we also asked them to categorize the habitat as natural or is it altered or degraded. Next slide. There is a ground truthing component uh, from scientists as well. Um, where we went out and, and fact-checked and also got some more habitat information on each location. Um, but natural sites, which obviously don't need to be restored, those can be recommended for protection um, or hopefully prevented from undergoing any type of habitat loss or degradation, whereas the altered or the degraded sites can be prioritized for habitat restoration. Next slide. And I say this so that you and your agency can plan ahead and compile a list of sites when funding becomes available. I know BTT and many other agencies have been approached to apply for federal funding for specific projects due to the recent world crisis that we're in. And this is obviously something nobody could have planned for. So it's so important to be ready with this list of potential projects 
um, as funding sources are available. Or if you have uh, specific funders coming saying, hey, we have this, this amount of money, do you have a project available? It's so important to have a variety of projects um, that are at the ready. Next slide. So we generated maps like these and although let me say that all spots were reported by anglers or kept com confidential so this is just an example map with fake sites um, but we can create maps like these with a the natural and altered sites along with our prioritization scale um, that includes things like land ownership um, a lot of times when you're getting federal funding you can't be working on private lands or or state funding needs to work on state lands also restoration feasibility are you looking at something before um, or something are you looking at a site that's in a marina or a golf course um, things like that and then also proximity to other natural or restored sites so once these juveniles are immigrating is there available habitat somewhat adjacent that they can move into next slide so ultimately it's about the habitat if we don't have healthy habitats we can't sustain healthy fisheries um, and with a massive amount of coastal habitat loss in our region and throughout the state, it's important that we explore habitat restoration, but it is so vital and imperative that it is done effectively. Next slide. Special thank you to all of our collaborators for this specific project. Next slide. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Well, thank you, Joellen. That was an excellent presentation. And I know that we're probably going to have a lot of questions here as we move over to minty.com. Up oh, and there, there they are. Go at <laughs> that it. That was my hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'll start at the top. Do you recommend designing inshore habitats for juveniles in general rather than sub adults? Um, great question. So the reason that we were focusing on juveniles is because that's what we had the most information about. And when I say most information, there's honestly very little information about juvenile tarpon, which was our focal species. We started finding in those habitats that they uh, often shared um, similar habitats with juvenile snook, which is, um, has a lot more documentation, but we know very little about the subadults. We're working on those habitats now with, um, like Rachel talked about in her presentation, the acoustic um, receivers and the acoustic tags, um, but we we wouldn't have enough information in order to restore for sub adults quite yet, which is why we're focusing on the juveniles. Do you consider creating native habitat mosaics with multiple natural system functions like water quality improvement and creating habitat for the widest diversity of fish and wildlife, a purpose for habitat restoration? That's a really great question. So it seems like in the past, it's these are what habitat restoration projects kind of look like. Um, they have different types of native habitat, all kind of boiled into one in order to have the biggest impact. But we don't know that those are especially successful. A lot of times you're working on smaller parcels of land um, and if you already have a species in there, like, like snook and tarpon that you can use as an umbrella species, you want to focus on that versus trying to focus on six or seven different species that may have conflicting habitat types that are necessary. So that's why I say really drill down when you're doing your planning on what you want to restore for. Do you think in future altered habitats will become the new nursery areas? Um, because of sea level rise and climate impacts, even if that's not what they were previously, we do. Um, so a, another plan for BTT is looking at 50 years from now, where will the potential juvenile tarpon habitats be? Because they may not be where they are right now. Um, so also I know that Swift Mud and also FWC, when they look at habitat restoration projects, there's always a climate change component in it. Um, as far as a gradient. So that way, as sea level rises, these habitats can move up the gradient. When you find habitats that are being used but are degraded, would you recommend they be restored even though it may change species using that area? That's something that you need to weigh when you're looking at specific projects. The, 
the other part from the, the previous question was, are altered habitats the new nursery habitats? And unfortunately, it's looking like yes. It's looking like uh, these tarpon and snook are inhabiting these places, but they're not productive. Even though on the outside, it may look like there are a lot of juvenile fish in there, a lot of life in these habitats. When we started looking at growth and immigration of our, some of our other sites, these fish weren't growing. So in natural habitats, they'd be growing eight to 10 inches a year. In these degraded habitats, they're still in there, but they're growing one inch a year. Um, and then also when they're immigrating, they're immigrating at much smaller sizes than they should be in natural habitats. Um, so yes, it's looking like altered habitats are the new ones just because that's what's available, um, which is why we're looking into habitat restoration for these altered habitats. Okay, when you find habitats that are being used but are degraded, would you recommend they be restored even though, um, again, that's something you need to weigh when you're looking at specific location. So for example, the Coral Creek one, if you look around, it's all upland habitat. Um, so you have these, we'll call them salt marsh canals, but they're directly adjacent to these pine flatwood, which you wouldn't typically see. However, when our focus is trying to increase the amount and, and the good habitat, I guess, for um, tarpon and snook, um, that's the way that we chose to restore. Are there funding sources that target species-specific types of restoration, or is this still a new concept? Honestly, it seems like the idea of including a specific biological component, including fisheries, is a very new idea. Um, especially when you start adding the monitoring components. Again, it, it seems like the previous school of thought was to add in just different types of habitats that you would normally see in an estuary or in a salt marsh, um, and then hope that the fish species that it normally attracts comes in. So yes, this is definitely a new concept. And as far as funding sources, it looks like they're kind of shifting their train of thought of, okay, well, if we can, if we can do something specific, then yeah, we'd like to fund that versus just doing restoration for the sake of restoration. Have you done work in Robinson Preserve at Manatee County? Um, not BTT specifically. We consulted early on in the project and they do use um, similar technology that we were using as far as the pit tags, but uh, we don't work directly at Robinson Preserve. Is anybody looking at tarpon populations along the Homosassa Crystal River region? The map didn't show any data. Great question. So we do have an adult tarpon fishery up there. Um, BTT has a five year long acoustic tagging project. This is tarpon about 20 pounds and up. So we're looking at the adult tarpon and potentially sub adult tarpon up there, but it seems like we're not getting a lot of juvenile tarpon sightings or accounts. Um, so it doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that it hasn't been reported to us. Just a comment on the nice point of the need value of target metrics. Thank you, it's amazing when you start looking at the literature, how few projects have a goal in mind. To what extent are tarpon and snook umbrella species for small to sawfish? Um, great question. Um, Honestly, they have very different habitats, and I know that Rachel can attest to this. It seems like what we know about small to sawfish, they're spending their time more up in the rivers and coming in and out of the rivers, whereas uh, tarpon and snook seem to be a little bit, I won't say higher salinity, um, but a lot more tidal and outside in the, in the back bay closer to the estuary areas. The restoration approach seems to prioritize economically important species over at-risk species. Yes, that's a really great point. And the reason that we focus on these economically important species is because that's how we receive funding to do the habitat restoration. Um, unfortunately, and again, that's why we tout them as the umbrella species. Unfortunately, if you start trying to raise money for sheep said minnow or killifish habitat restoration, you may come up a little short. Um, in 
in the arena that we're working with now. So instead, we can receive our dollars and receive um, our funding and our attention by looking at more game fish or charismatic species, even though those other species fall under that umbrella. Have you shared with regulatory agencies to show how valuable these resources are? We do. We work very closely with um, agencies that either do the habitat restoration or are funding habitat restorations or are looking to do their own habitat restorations. I think that's all the time that we have now. Yes, thank you, Joellen. Uh, that was wonderful. And if, again, any of you have any questions for Joellen, feel free to contact her directly with the proceedings. We're going to move on to the next presentation by FWC.